Anderson. Please help me this morning in welcoming Theodore Richards. We are so grateful that you could be here with us today. Theodore is an educator, writer, and philosopher. He is the founder of the Chicago Wisdom Project, now Wisdom Projects Incorporated, and editor of the online magazine and podcast called Reimagining. His work is dedicated to reimagining education and creating new narratives about our place in the world. He's also the author of eight books and has numerous literary awards for them and just released this month his new book, Reimagining the Classroom. So with that, I'll turn it over for this morning's Dharma talk entitled Reimagining the Classroom. Thank you for being here. Yeah, uh, let me know what my sound is. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, can you hear us online? Sandy, can you give us a thumbs up? All right, good. Okay, thank you. Um, it's really great to be back here. It's my first time in the new, in the new space. Um, and uh, I just wanna thank you for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the content, of, I'm talking about education and the content of, of, of the book called Reimagining the Classroom. Mm -hmm. And, and sort of relate it to, to Buddhist philosophy and think about how we can consider teaching and learning in, in, a, in a way that's consistent with, with Buddhist philosophy. So um, let's start, start with the concept of classroom. I call it reimagining the classroom. And I'd like you like for a moment to think about the notion of classroom not as a room that has four walls, but as a metaphorical space, a space that represents our, our values and our hopes for what we want the world to be. Um, and to think about a classroom, another way to think about it is to think of the classroom as a microcosm. That is to say like, whatever our worldview is, whatever values we hold for the broader world, those are the values and the symbols and the stories that will be told in the learning space. So, for example, the way that we might sit, the way that we might uh, relate to one another, all of those things are reflected in the interactions that happen in the learning space. And, that the, and the things that we're actually teaching, of course, content and curriculum and those kinds of ideas are important. But what's actually being taught on a deeper level, at a more profound level, are our most deeply held values and assumptions about the world and how it works. Um, for example, I could teach you, I could tell you all day about the importance of, of, of some kind of value that we might hold, like let's say like equality or, 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 or social justice. But if the interactions that happen in the learning space don't reflect those values, I'm actually teaching something quite different on a deeper, more profound level. Um, so the question then is, well, what are the values that we have that we're teaching in, in, our, in most classrooms, in a conventional learning space that most children will grow up in. Um, and you know, I wanna say that I understand that there are many exceptions to this, but I'm talking in very broad generalities about how a, a, a conventional classroom functions. It has functioned for quite a while. What are the, what are the metaphors that are, being, that are being conveyed in those learning spaces? So I would describe those in three different ways. Um, the first metaphor uh, is the metaphor of the factory. So if you think about the world in a mechanistic way, if those are like kind of the values of industrial capitalist civilization, that, the, that, the, that, the, that our world is, is, is a machine, then we have a, a classroom that, that reflects those values. For example, we, we, uh, my oldest daughter, who's in high school, she has a very precise amount of time for English, and she goes into her English class, and the English teacher deposits English into her. And she learns English in this way, right? And then she goes to math, and, and, the, and the bell rings at a precise time, regardless of what's happening. She moves on to her, her math class, at which point she will have the, 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 the content of math deposited into her as if she were on a conveyor belt, right? Um, the second metaphor that I would share is the metaphor of the prison. Um, and, and this is, 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 I think, most profoundly felt 
in in schools in which you find uh, and, and there are a lot of sort of like racist and classist um, um, assumptions that are made about certain children in certain neighborhoods from certain social classes that they need more discipline and you have punitive measures to deal with anything that happens and that the idea is not to have a a, a, a flourishing that happens in the learning space, but to escape the learning space. Very much like in certain theologies we teach that the world itself is fallen and that our, that our purpose in life is to escape this fallen place. And then the, the third metaphor that I'll use is the metaphor of the free market, which is sort of in vogue today. We have, we have, we have uh, programs like, like Race to the Top and No Child Left Behind. And the, the idea is that we enter into a learning space and we're there to compete with each other. We're there to, we go there as, as, as individuals, just like in the, in the free market system, we go there as individuals and our purpose in those learning spaces is to compete with other people, not to cooperate, not to collaborate, but to compete and to succeed for ourselves. And, uh, and in fact, that's, that's projected onto the schools themselves. We have a program like, like, like uh, uh, Race to the Top in which schools test scores are measured and, and the success and failure of a school is based upon those scores versus other schools. Um, and the idea is that we'll, we'll succeed more if there's more competition. And there are other ways we can understand the metaphors that are, that are taught in our schools for sure. Um, and, and those are kind of three that I would critique, but I'll make kind of a generalization about those three different metaphors. In each case, they're metaphors in which there's an assumption about the world that we are fundamentally individuals that our most fundamental identity is as an individual that is separate from one another in each case. Whether we're in competition, whether we're trying to escape, whether we're being punished for our actions, uh, uh, and whether we are we're kind of machines on a conveyor belt, in each case, we're entering into a space as individuals, right? So I would offer, and this is a return to a very, and each of these, in each of these individualist me metaphors are rooted in the, in the, in the values of a civilization that is the industrial capitalist civilization that we, that we're all living in, in this, in this room anyway. And, and I would offer that if we look at this from a, from the perspective of Buddhist philosophy, in which the, the universe is fundamentally conceived of as relational. It's also an ecological way of thinking about the world. There are other ways we can frame it. But in this case, I'm, I'm referring to the way in which we are, there is a, I was thinking as we were sitting earlier today, actually, as a, as a, as a diversion, how it's really funny that you find, uh, you find uh, the works of Buddhist teachers in the, in the self-help section in, in bookstores. Isn't that kind of funny? It, when, when the core concept is, a, is, is, a, is a, of, of no self, and like, I wonder what Pema Chodron thinks of this, you know? Um, I mean, she's, and she's a wonderful teacher and she surely understands the notion of no self better than I do. But you can definitely find her, if you go to any bookstore, I think you'll find her books in the self-help section, right? Um, so like, what is this self that we're trying to help? Um, but her work is helpful, but maybe not <laughs> to the self. Um, but let's explore that for a second. If we really take seriously this concept of no self, which which means that we're fundamentally relational beings, that when we try to when we try to identify what this who we are as 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 beings, the notion that we are individuals and that we are and somehow can separate ourselves from other beings, that is one of, if not the most fundamental delusion that we have as human beings, that we are separate from. And that is the core value that is taught in our schools. It's not taught in a curriculum. You know, it's not like they line the kids up and say, oh, you are individuals, but it's taught in the way that, that the interactions occur in the learning space. It's taught in the way that the seats are arranged. It's taught in the way that we talk about success and failure. It's taught in the way that we convey value in the, in, 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 in the child or in the adult, whoever's in any kind of learning space. And so those, those values are taught not explicitly, but implicitly through metaphor and, and through story. 
because the story of who we are is the most fundamental thing about how we understand our place in the world. Um, so I'd like to offer then a couple of different ways of thinking as an alternative to these metaphors that I share. Um, and and these are there, there are many different ways to think about this, but these are just some 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 kind of metaphors that I've uh, adopted. And what I'm saying is, how can we look at a learning space? How can we look at the life of a child, the interactions between? This isn't just about a school; it can be about the way in which. In fact, I I wrote this book and conceived of a lot of this during the pandemic, in which I was homeschooling my two youngest children, who are who had, who were. Um, in kindergarten and first grade. And you know, when you're when you're homeschooling a child, particularly in the context of a pandemic, you you're really kind of forced to to think about well, you're forced to think about what you're gonna teach that day. Like what are you gonna do, right? Um, and you're also forced to and, and another way of thinking about that is, is is that you're forced to think about what's really important. And you realize that you're not just there that that you're that the classroom is it still exists but it exists in the way that you've that you create a learning space for your children whether it's at home whether it's in your backyard or an empty field or or at a beach um or a forest or wherever um so i'll offer then a few a few metaphors that i think could be more useful than thinking of the metaphor of say a factory for the way we might teach our children um so the first is, I would say that metaphors ought to be holistic. That is to say, like they should they should convey a sense of of planetary consciousness. Now, what I mean by this is, how can we create a learning space that fosters an awareness of our global interconnection? And and I think this is profoundly important at this moment because we have uh, we're living in a world in which in which we're increasingly for us to think about questions and ways in which our actions may affect the entire planet. And we're recognizing in some ways that we are, that we are just as, that we have a world that is, that is interconnected and that we are, and we only have one planet that we can live on. And our actions that we, that we, that we take have consequences from which we cannot escape. The second one is depth, and I want to. I want to under. I want to. What I mean by this is that it's important to acknowledge that we each have an interior life, and that a learning space has an interior life, and that there, we're not simply two dimensional. Even even the people sitting in front of us on the screen here, which is two dimensions, and I thought of this a lot as my oldest child, who's in high school, was doing this remote learning thing, and she was on a screen all day. And the teachers did a wonderful job, actually. They, they worked really hard. I, I'm not criticizing what the teachers did at all. Um, but the problem was with the model, because the model didn't acknowledge, and this was, this was really important for, my, for my, my teenager, didn't acknowledge that in addition to the content that she was learning, what was also important was that she had this interior life. And it's, and, and it's so important to recognize that each of us has a, a, a vast cosmos inside of us. Beyond just the content we're learning, we're also going through all kinds of social and emotional things. Um, the third is, is the recognition of difference and diversity. So just as, though we, just as we are a single species on a single planet, we're also, it's also so important to recognize that we are different from one another, and that it's important that we each have different stories and different perspectives, and that's where the learning really becomes enriched. So like when we have a conversation, I can share with you an idea if I'm the teacher, but where the learning happens is that each person in the space has a different perspective and will, and will respond to that differently. And the learning happens not in the idea being given, but in the space between the individual where there's conversation, dialogue, and exchange of ideas. Um, we're increasingly recognizing that our planet is in peril because of the lack, because of a, 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 decrease, a decreased biological diversity. 
we have an, an, a healthy ecosystem requires diversity, requires a variety of species in order to thrive. Similarly, culturally, we need different perspectives. We need different ideas, different ways of seeing the world. When we lose a culture, when we lose a language, when we lose a, um, uh, that, that we're losing a way of seeing the world that's different and unique and important. Um, and I'd relate that to the next metaphor, which is ecology. I mentioned before, the way that we think about the world as an interconnected set of systems is an ecological way of seeing the world. The idea that uh, uh, we, we, we are radical individuals makes no sense when we understand ourselves as part of ecology, an, an ecosystem, that we're interconnected in that way. The next um, idea, I call it the power of circles. Uh, and if you think of creating a learning space in which each person can be seen and heard and can see and hear everyone else, we create a space in which each person is honored and listened to and heard. Um, we create a space in which we have, to, we have to really recognize what a learning space tells us about power and agency. Each time you raise your hand and ask permission to use the bathroom, you've ceded control and power of your body over to someone else. You've taught someone. If you tell someone you can only go to the bathroom at a scheduled time, you're teaching that person that they ultimately do not have control of their body. So if we sit in a circle, if we recognize that each person has something to share and something to give and a gift to bring, we're teaching that each person is valued in the space. Um, and then I think that the value of humility is important. As elders, as educators, the way you teach humility is not by telling people to be humble, it is by modeling that. It's by recognizing that we don't know all. And that we can't know it all. By modeling that, by being willing to listen and hear from the wisdom of others, we show that that humility is possible. And once you once you recognize that 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 the value of humility, you recognize that you're always learning. And and lastly, I will share the value of wildness and play. Part of the reason that we structure our schools and our classrooms in the way that we do is because we fear the wildness of children. We fear sometimes the wildness of ourselves. But it's actually that, that, that playfulness in which the most profound learning happens. And it's not just little kids playing I'm talking about. I'm talking about the exchange of ideas. That's play. When we create something new, that's play. Uh, when we have a meaningful conversation, that is a form of play. And, and that is also, I think, in that, in those, in those uncontrolled and, and somewhat wild relationships that happen when we're being playful, that's when the most, that's when the most uh, profound, profound learning happens. Um, and, and so those are kind of the ways in which we would create, I think, those are ways in which I'm, I'm suggesting we could create a learning space, the value, some values that would be useful to think about a learning space in each that are, that are more relational and organic rather than the values that we have in, our, in, in many conventional classrooms. Um, and I'd add to that, in addition to space, there's also a learning process that's profoundly important. It's not just what we teach, it's the space we teach in, and it's also the pedagogy, the way in which we teach. And in, when, we're, when we're entering into a process of learning, I think the thing to recognize is that there's a story that we're telling in, each, in any learning space. And I'll share with you that, that part, of the, part of the reason I wrote this book was that I was really impacted by a story that occurred um, while during the during the pandemic while I was homeschooling my kids, and I was actually our family had actually moved temporarily to Florida 
to spend part of the the the, the, the coldest winter of the of the lockdown here. Um, and we news came from Chicago that a boy had been shot, a 13 year old boy. He was a CPS student, same age, just like my, my own oldest daughter. He'd been shot by the police in an alley. His name was Adam Toledo. And the, the, I, I don't, I'm the, 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 I don't want to get into the details of, of all of it, but what, what ultimately emerged and what came out of the public discourse was that while the boy didn't have a gun in his hand when he was shot, he did at some point during the interaction with the police, during some time at that point, had a, had a gun in his hand. And, and, the, and the public discourse shifted quickly from blaming the child or the police to blaming the person who put the gun in the boy's hand. And it was, it was sort of a convenient pivot, I think, for the people who are running the city because it avoided them to, it allowed them to avoid some of the harder questions that might've been asked about the whole event. And it, but it's not invalid to say that it was a problem that someone gave a 13 year old child a gun. For sure that was problematic. But I, as I reflected on that, I, it made me think to myself, what is it that I've put in the hands of my own child? who's also 13 years old, if not a gun. Whether, and, and, and the reason I'm asking that question as I am is because I think that what was given to the child, and why he ended up gunned down in an alley was not just because of the simple act of the physical object that was placed in his hand, but because that object contained with it a story the object contained with it a story about who he was and about what, how he was valued, about what his life was worth. So I could give my own child a pencil, maybe, or a book, or an idea, or a sense of, of, of her place in the world in some other way. And I will give her that in some way, because regardless of what I'm doing, whatever I put in her hands, whatever I do with her, however I interact with her, I'm telling her a story about who she is, about her place in the world. And that's what we do as parents, as grandparents, as elders, and as educators. We convey to our children a story about their place in the world. And we do so largely in ways that are unconscious, just like when we arrange the chairs in a room, we do so in ways that are unconscious. But what's important is that we become aware that we are telling a story. And I think what's most important is that that story is that when we're, we're engaging with people, that we recognize that the story must reflect the whole person. For example, it can't just be a story that's conveyed for ideas. It has to engage the body, the interior life. And it has to recognize that when we're telling a story about a person, our story is a web of stories. It's a web of interconnected stories because we're not isolated individuals. And I would then suggest to you that just as, just as we aren't educated as individuals, we're also, and, and just as we're educated through stories, that at the end of the process, the, no, it's okay. That at the end of the process, our uh, the best uh, the best test for this, if you want to, if you want, because we've 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 focused so much on standardized testing because it's the easy easy thing to test, right? It's the thing that we can that we can, and there's nothing wrong in, with a test per se, but there is a problem when with it when we focus solely on a test because it's the easiest thing to, to see. It's, it's like the story of, of uh, do you know the, the Mullah Nasruddin story about finding his key under the, under, the, under the lamppost? So this is a Sufi tale about uh, sort of a trickster, holy fool story about Mullah Nasruddin who was looking for his key under a lamppost. And someone came along and said, Mullah, what's wrong? What are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my key. 
So they look and they look under the lamppost at night, right? And they spend there looking and looking and looking and looking. And eventually uh, he turns to the mullah and he says, mullah, are you sure you left your key under the lamppost? And mullah says, well, no, actually, I'm pretty sure I left it in the dark alley over there. And, and he says, well, why are we looking at the lamppost? And, and Mullah says, well, isn't it obvious we're looking here because that's where all the light is. And that's, I think, the best story to indicate what we've done in relationship to our education system in terms of testing. We test the things that are most easily seen. And there's some value in that. It'll tell you something, but it may not tell you the most important things, the things that are actually in the, in the dark alley, metaphorically. Um, so I think the test, if we take seriously the notion that a classroom is a metaphor for a microcosm of the world, the test is actually not the test score, not even the, the success as measured by our global economy. The test is the kind of world that we create then, which is a little hard to measure. It takes a long time to see what, it, what happens. Um, but part of the indication is found in the way in which our young people are able to look at their world and reimagine the story that's told about their world and their place in the world. So I'm open to have a conversation and dialogue. So if anybody wants to, to join in, I don't know if uh, give a yeah, that would be that works. yeah. And I have another mic here for those in the room. Can you hear me? I think we need to zoom out the room. Thank you, Julie. Good to see you. Um, so if we have any comments, questions, either online or in person, oh, we have one here in person. Thank you. <laughs> I've spent a few years teaching in the inner city of Chicago. And it's really hard for me to to relate to I it, it helps me relate to what you're saying. Um, but it's it's a long distance to what we normally think of when we think of classrooms in this country. It, I, I tend to separate out in you know a level below the standards. Uh, I'm thinking of the bathrooms that are leaking. I'm thinking of uh, just uh, the seems like seemingly more of a regimented regimented structure. And well, you, I'm sure you know what what that's like. Does this we? I'm having a harder time relating what you're saying to this inner city classrooms situation. And I, maybe I'm asking what, what you could say to that. Yeah, I, I, I think that, I think that, um, I think that it's hard to, to, it, it's a, it's a, it's a big jump from what we're generally used to in any school, in most schools. Um, I think that it's probably worth just sort of saying out loud that um, the kinds of ideas that I'm sharing are reflected in some schools, but they're largely reflected in the schools of the privileged. Um, and partly that's because of resources, but it's also because I think uh, it, 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 of the of the things that I that I shared about this notion of 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 control that we have about if if a person that that would need is more is more discipline and more punitive measurements and I'm not suggesting in any way that you're that that was your attitude personally mm -hmm. but it's but it's it's pervasive in in our schools and in, in many school districts it's pervasive you know um, you know for, for you know there there so the notion of of zero tolerance, for example, um, is something you'd find in a school that is, it, you, you would seldom find notions of zero tolerance in, in a school for the privilege. So I think that's, that's part of what's going on. Um, I think also, you know, since you 
brought it up, I think that again, if we go back to this, this, the, if we go back to a, a Buddhist cosmology and think about what it actually means to be a being, if we take that seriously, the idea in a lot of spaces, particularly for, and, and I've seen this personally, and I think perhaps you have too, the idea in a lot of spaces for, for people who are at the margins of society is to suggest to them that their, that their situation in life is largely due to their own choices. That's a recurring theme you'll find in many places, that you have to make better choices if you want to be successful in our world. And there's some truth to that, I think. But what's also true is that it's impossible to separate anyone's position in life from the web of relationships in which they're, they're embedded. A more useful thing, and this, I've done this with, with young people, is to think about a situation. For example, I've taught in a group of, of high school dropouts once, and we talked about why they dropped out of school. And so we simply just made a mandala, a set of concentric circles, and talked about how they made a choice individually at the center. But then also they had a family situation that perhaps contributed to, their, to that choice and to that situation. They had a neighborhood, they had a school system, they had a society, they had a whole world. And, and it was impossible to separate the individual choice from that web of relationships. So, um, I don't know if that answers any of your, what your question was, sort of, but I mean, I think if we think more broadly about actually and take seriously what it means to be a human being, and we take seriously the idea that, that we are actually immersed in, in a web of interconnections, and take seriously the notion that each child is, is of equal value, I think that would be maybe, maybe a start. Another comment over here. Uh, you know, I really appreciated you sort of bringing out sort of this concept of the space we create. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder what was running through my mind is how even just that particular concept applies to adult learning or workplaces or sangha spaces mm -hmm. or you know um that we it's interesting uh, you know focusing on being a bodhisattva you can get focused on self again yeah. <laughs> and what you are doing uh rather than even just the ecological space around your sphere so i uh, uh, I, I don't know, it's just got me thinking a lot more about that. So if you want to comment on that. And then I'm also very interested in knowing what the wisdom project is. Sure. Yeah. Um, to your first point, yeah, absolutely. I think every, every space, whether it's, it's a sangha space or a, a, a workspace, as you, as you point out, I think all, all those spaces are, are actually just like rich with uh, symbolism and rich with sort of subtle implicit values and 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 meaning regarding let's say power right um so i think it's it's useful to think about how we create a space and i, and I think probably my, my guess would be like for example in this space that a lot more care was or, or intentionality was put into it than in some other spaces right um just as an example, but I, I, I think that the level of care that's put into this space ought to be put into a lot of other kinds of spaces, you know, um, because we are teaching something in the way that we, that we line up the chairs and the way that we sit and also in the way that we relate to one another, you know, like the way that we might, you know, you know, like, for example, like if I ask a question, as opposed to giving a lecture that gives kind of a different that, that's teaching a different lesson. Even if I'm saying, even if I'm getting to the same content, I'm doing it in a different way, a way that, that honors you and your opinion and your feeling about things. So I think that, I think that, there are, I think that it's, it's really important to think about those relationships. And it's, it's a, they have a recursive nature, meaning the values of the civilization dictate how, we, how the space looks. So the values of say capitalist industrial civilization has fed how we create a classroom. But then 
the classroom itself reifies those values in that space. And so in order to really get out of that, that cycle, it requires real intentionality. It requires, it requires something really different and radical in the way we think about those spaces. And I'm suggesting that, that our, our, our civilization is at a place where we do need that kind of removal from that cycle. Um, and, and you also asked about uh, with, uh, wisdom projects. So, so uh, I started the Chicago Wisdom Project here and we ran after school programs, summer camps, retreats for youth, uh, community garden. We did a whole bunch of different programs. Uh, over time, we created uh, a relationship with a group in Baltimore, which became the Baltimore, Religion, uh, Baltimore Wisdom Project. We merged with the Baltimore Wisdom Project and became Wisdom Projects Incorporated. Um, a lot of our youth, pro our youth program is primarily now in Baltimore, uh, and mostly through after school programming is the biggest, is the biggest way that we do work directly with, with youth in Baltimore. But in addition to that, part of our mission is to engage people in dialogue around questions about education. So we do a podcast, we do, uh, we have an online magazine and, and we do kind of like workshops and stuff like that for, for with educators. So, um, in around some of the ideas that we're talking about today. Greetings, everyone. That's, I thought, Sandy, I thought Sandy. that was a tree. I saw the tree. Tree. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, Sandy has encouraged me to unmute myself and to introduce myself briefly. And to, I would like to start by giving the highest of bows and blessings to you, Ted for the generosity and wisdom of your thought. Your new book, Reimagining the Classroom, is an extraordinary intervention into the lives that we lead as parents, educators, as people who are dedicated to a kind of learning that confronts the true suffering of many different kinds of students within our society. I, my name is Tree and I am humbled to lead Wisdom Projects Incorporated with you, Ted. Dr. Richards and I are building movements, fresh movements for holistic education and peace education. With his thought leadership based in Chicago and our direct services in support groups, after school programming, counseling, peer support, and trainings here in Baltimore City. So it's the synergy of the work that we do that is given uplift in Ted's new book reimagining the classroom and i am just so grateful for the work that you're doing ted and humble to join all of you i'd like to briefly comment on anatta the concept of no self or non-self that you raised ted in your comments and i would like to preface by saying that my view comes from the fact that I am a Upasaka, a lay ordained Buddhist in my 35th year of contemplative practice. And I've seen a lot and learned a lot. I was originally ordained by Mechi Chandra Kunyong in Thailand at Wat Dharmakaya. I wanted to encourage us all to realize that Anatta has been historically used in modern times as a weapon against individuals who are seen mistakenly as drawing too much attention to their identities. So when Buddhism came to the, the United States of America and to Western European regions, it was often used mistakenly to say, hey, you black Buddhists, don't call too much attention to your race because relationally we are all the same. And it then went from there. 
as a Black Buddhist, a Black American Buddhist, I became curious about that way of looking at non-self and anatta. And I just want to encourage us to keep that in our hearts and minds, as we know that the Buddha in those first suttas was speaking out against the rigidity of the thinking of the soul in Hindu thought. And he offered a version of being both epistemological and ontological, knowing and being that said, hey, if I may break it down in common language, we evolve and we evolve by attuning ourselves to ending suffering and by attuning ourselves to becoming far more thoughtful and relational, as Ted so beautifully said, in what we do and how we think. So this way of thinking about non-self is different than saying that we're being too selfish or we're being too focused on our identities. And so I encourage those subtle distinctions and I hand back the, the space to you, Ted. Thanks, Tree. Uh, it's so good to hear your voice. I, I, so Tree, Tree, is, Tree and I are the co-directors of Wisdom Project. Tree is based in Baltimore. Uh, and, and obviously, I'm here in Chicago. So um, just, and um, I really appreciate that. I saw the, I saw the image of the tree on the screen, and I thought maybe that was that was you, Tree. So, <laughs> but um, th no, thank you for that. That was really, that was really, that was really great. Are there uh, comments or questions, hey, Paul? Um, given all the situations now if you were trying to get to where you and we feel like for better education what would you do to start to get there and you mean uh sort of like given like the political realities of our situation in the world yeah um, no, thank you for that. That's a good and very difficult question that I absolutely cannot answer uh, <laughs> with any kind of <laughs> definitive answer. Um, you know, I think that, I think that, I think that, that our, our, our situation in terms of the, the, the largely the politics of, of the way we think of public education has has been has been not particularly i think progressive either on the left or the right the way it's been approached certainly on the left there's a greater willingness to invest in public education than on the right um but in both cases i think there is a profoundly uh individualistic and 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 hyper hyper focused on on kind of capitalism and 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 competition view of education so i think that i think that what i'd like to do and this doesn't really get to the politics of it but but what i what I, my hope is that we can begin to ask the question what does it mean to be actually educated like there's an assumption i think that's made you know like in the story of of mullah nasruddin there's an assumption that higher test scores means better educated Right, um, and I would, I would, I, I'm not suggesting we should go for lower test scores, you know, and I'm also not suggesting that like test scores don't mean anything. They do mean something. It's just I wouldn't conflate that meaning with the ultimate purpose of why we even have schools in the first place. Why do we have schools? What's the what's the point? Um, for example, one point would be. Because if we take seriously a democracy, we can't have a democracy without people who are educated in order to participate in that democracy. So that means people who are capable of having discernment about, say, for example, uh, uh, the, inform the, the information that they're saturated with and how to work through that and how to determine what's, what's true and what's not true. And I'm not saying these are like easy, easy things to do, 
But I think that like thinking about how a person can participate in a democracy ought to be a purpose of our schools. And I think in some cases it is, but I think it's, it's, that's decreasingly so. I think because mostly what we're focused on is individual achievement in our schools. And those aren't mutually exclusive aims. Getting somebody to, be, to think more critically, for example, is actually a great way to train a person's mind and prepare a person for, uh, uh, say, higher education. One thing that we found in schools that have like these amazing graduation rates, these hyper-disciplined, zero-tolerance charter schools with great graduation rates and everybody gets accepted to college, is that students in those schools have a hard time adjusting to college. Why is that? Well, because one thing that happens in college is you have more freedom and you're participating in, in, in more nuanced conversations and having to work through more nuanced questions, right? Um, and so I think that, so I think that beginning to ask the question, what does it mean to be an educated person would be, would be a start, you know? And thinking about, and I do think, um, you know, the word democracy is thrown around a lot, but I do think we can use it. I don't think it's, we've lost the word yet, like some other words. But I think we can say like, well, if, if we have, we take seriously the notion that public schools are serve a purpose in a democracy, then I think we can look at how, what, is, what, the, what does a democratic classroom look like? I don't think that answers all the questions that I'm trying to address, but it's, it's, it does answer some of the questions in terms of how we interact with one another and what a school might look like and what some of the aims of the school are. You know, if, if we tell a kindergartner, you know, you need to get a high test score so we can compete in the global economy, it's a really poor way to motivate a kindergartner, for one. And two, it's absurd to focus on a global economy that we don't know will exist in five years, much less in 15, 20 years when that kindergartner's there. Um, so I think, I think on all sides of the political spectrum, most sides of it anyway, we're, we're looking at the wrong, we're asking some of the wrong questions. That's what I would start, that's what I would start with. And, and questions about education have been politicized in extremely unhealthy ways, like, like many, other, many other things in our society. We've got uh, online, go ahead, Julie. Hey, Todd. Hey, Julie, it's good to see you. I thought I, thought I saw you there, it's hard, a little hard to see from where I'm sitting, but yeah. Yeah, so nice to see you. I got to I got to work with Ted for a while with the Wisdom Project. It was really fun, um, and uh, I even had like uh, I took some of the ideas because I took his teacher course on it, the Wisdom Project teacher course, and I got to do um, some of the activities in the uh, prison for kids. Like we did a council circle, and there was some some good successes there. I was happy with it, but uh, one thing two things that came up while I was listening to your talk, which was marvelous. Um, and so happy to have you here too, Tree. It's uh, nice to hear your voice. Um, I thought of, uh, I did really well in school. I got like all A's and stuff pretty much. And I felt like one thing that they kind of, that I missed out on was the focus was on getting to college, which I did. But once I got there, I um, had to kind of switch gears and understand that it was like, I was supposed, I should have been focusing on what, what do you want to do with your life and um, stuff like that. So I, I had trouble uh, choosing a major, et cetera. Um, but one thing that they did really well was um, that I really appreciate was um, I did feel valued in my education experience. And in particular in middle school in Georgia, they had a high ropes course in a PE class. And it was like spooky to do a little bit, but also exciting and they did team building beforehand. So you had like the belay ropes and everything. And uh, it really, um, looking back, that was like a really powerful experience in um, how I learned how to approach, uh, adventure and fear, um, that I really got in my body, you know, in gym class. 
And I don't, you know, that's something I would definitely recommend. It's great to see you. Uh, uh, Julie was a terrific meditation teacher that, for us for a couple couple years, I think, you know, um, and and uh, and we did we we've over the years we've done um, some 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 high and low ropes course stuff with young people it's part of our retreats that we that we that we've done um and i think they're terrific you know and, and i think that like facing unknowns and fear and like doing so in an embodied way is, is an extremely important thing um yeah and as far as like the focus on college i think that um there's a lot of layers to that i i will say like you know and i can i feel this as a parent too you know like it's it's um I think that what I don't want to do is sound as though uh, I would criticize a parent for wanting their kid to get good grades and go to college because that's how I feel you know what I mean like as a parent it's like it's like we're like yeah they should just have you know you know ha have 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 a great experience and, and learn about themselves, but I think that it's normal and understandable why every parent wants wants a child to succeed and to do things like go to college or get a good job all of those things are like going to be motivating factors for parents and for some kids too you know not all kids but some kids um and and so i wouldn't i think it's not particularly useful to kind of criticize that i think what's what's more useful is to say that you know parents generally i think we can start with an assumption that parents generally want what's best for their children it's not you know it's it's you know, there are always exceptions to that, but I think that's generally true. And sometimes the way that that comes forward is, and, and, and I think that's true with most teachers too. I think teachers want the best for their students, mostly. Um, and I think people are gonna see that in, in kind of a whole bunch of different ways. Um, what's I think helpful though, is kind of taking a breath for a moment. And even when I think about, what do I think about it's college or a job or any kind of long-term outcome, I think what's really helpful, and actually my, my 14 year old will say this to, to us, to, to, to my wife and I sometimes, she'll say, you know, we talk about some big heavy subject or, or in going on in the world, or we're talking about, you know, what her hopes and dreams are for her future. And she'll be like, I'm 14, I just wanna be a kid, you know? And I think like allowing a child to have like an authentic childhood and an ex experience as a child is really, really important and, and useful to, to, to focus on. So I think that, um, in, in some ways, maybe that's what you're saying, Julie, but I think that like being present in the moment, childhood it can be, can be very difficult. It also can be wonderful. So, and I think as an educator, part of the work is to allow for a childhood to actually happen. You know what I mean? Because sometimes there are forces that are pushing against that, that make an authentic childhood very hard for some children. Um, but I think that as educators, we ought to not only focus on the future, but on the on the beauty that is being a child. I think that's wonderful. I mean, thank you so much. It's just so many great uh, pieces to think about here. But before I have my question, I'll hand it off here. Oh, you had a question? Oh. Would you wrap it up? Um, I, I just had a kind of question about curiosity. And, and kind of how it relates to education. And like when you talk about the three different models, um, you know, the conveyor belt, it's kind of like, well, let's just, you know, from a student's mindset, like, let's get to the end of the day where I can have fun or leave or like in the prison society, maybe just not getting in trouble or not getting caught. Um, free market, just, you know, I'm here to gain some type of advantage over other people, some type of advantage for myself. Right, right. And, and none of those, like, models that you're talking about, is there any, like, curiosity, right? Like, there's no, and, and I see it in my workplace all the time, people come into the workplace, they're just not curious about anything. They, they want to do things that will advantage them in some way, but they're not really sometimes curious about the work or curious about things. And you know, we have kids, and it's the same situation. They're, they're in a spot where, you know, I want to figure out how to foster that curiosity about the world that they're in, about what they can learn, curiosity about others, and it seems to kind of die in the school coach culture. And I was just wondering if you had any like comments or anything that kind of help bring curiosity back. How do we just kind of bring that back into the classroom, into life in general? Yeah, thanks. That's that's a great comment. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. 
you know, how you're relating that to um, uh, those metaphors to to a lack, there being a lack of curiosity. Yeah, that's that's a really good comment. I think that curiosity is 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 probably so. So what you're looking to do, and I think you're what you're getting at is what you're looking to do is you're looking to to figure out a way where a person engages with the world that allows for them to continue to learn and grow. Right. I mean, that's the goal, right? right? The goal, because there's no amount of, so I, I'll draw a little bit from, from, from Paulo Freire here. So Paulo Freire has this idea that we think of education as in terms of the, the meta, he uses the metaphor of a bank in terms of your depositing information in a person. And he, he, he thinks this through in terms of marginalized people in terms of what that teaches us about power. So if you're teaching a person who is, 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 is oppressed, as he put it, puts it in his work, no matter what you teach and how much you give them, if you're reinforcing the power relationship of teacher and student, if you're constantly giving them information, what you're, re what you're teaching that person is that, they, that you have the power and they do not, and that the purpose of education is to then gain access to that power, right? To, have, to be the person who holds the information then. It's a very different way. It's a less kind of relational way of thinking about education as a way of inspiring a person to seek out their world, to uncover their world, and to then begin to tell their, their own story about their world, which is, I think, a way of describing curiosity, as you're putting it. Um, so I think, I mean, I do talk a lot about very specific things we do. Um, it has to, I think, I think that for example, asking questions as opposed to like talking at, at a person, thinking about a space, right? Think about what does a space look like in which in which a person can explore? And this is more, I think, easier to think through with a younger child. You said you have, you have children? Yeah. How old are they? Sixth and eighth grade. So. Sixth and eighth grade, right. So they're, they're at an age where they're like, you know, um, they're wanting to separate from you a little bit right i mean they're wanted they're just they're they're finding their own identity particularly eighth graders right they're finding an identity that's separate from from parents i think is like a a, a big thing that happens at that phase of, of life um you know and i think that, that figuring out a way figuring out a way that it, it's hard because and i think the one thing that happens at that age as a parent, I'm just speaking as a parent now, not as a teacher, let's just talk about that for a second. Like, I think one thing that happens with an eighth grader, and I have no idea how this is for you, is it can be really scary to give them the, the ability to explore their world without you. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of like one of the big steps. It's not really a big step for them. They're like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. It's, it's actually like a parenting issue, right. I think, at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, because that's what they want, right? Like when you're when I was homeschooling my my at the time kindergartner and first grader, it was like about me creating a space that we'd explore together. But you know, my 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 other child was in seventh grade at the time, similar ages to your kid. She didn't want that. She wanted to go explore the world. She couldn't because it was a pandemic. You know, that was what was really hard on her. But I think that and now, once the pandemic kind of slowed and people began to go out in the world, it's like she wants to get on the train. She wants to get on the bus. She wants to go explore Chicago. She wants to, you know, walk around with her friends in the streets. You know, that's her way of exploring. So um, I think that, you know, for kids as they get older, then it becomes a, a, a matter of doing a little bit of, of letting go, which is hard, you know. Um, and realizing that the learning that happens, I'll just say this one more thing, the learning that happens isn't just, it become, it's not, the fear is that they'll make a mistake. But that's the whole point, that they're gonna make mistakes. And they'll make like a bunch of bad decisions, you know? And you have to like figure out how to make those decisions, not be like, horrible and life-threatening, of course, but like that it's actually okay if they make mistakes, you know? Um, but that's the play part, right? Like that's the, the play, think of that of play as a metaphor, like, like part of play is that you, you have a space in which you can like make mistakes.
And I think that having a world that's too safe and too sterile is a recipe for like losing your curiosity, you know? Can I jump in with a question? Is that Cheryl? I was just going to, yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. Um, I, I feel like I'm being rude. I just, um, jumping in. No, not at all. Um, not at all. Come on. I was just gonna, I was just gonna call out to you. So thank you for unmuting um, yourself. What you're speaking of reimagining the classroom, reimagining learning and teaching is a topic I've been looking at a lot. Uh, Ted, in fact, I uh, learned of you uh, through a podcast uh, that you gave about uh, meetings with remarkable educators uh, with Bob Lovemore. Um, it's wonderful to find more and more serious people writing and talking about this. Um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. Sometimes I find myself getting frustrated with the feeling that all the dancers aren't seeing each other, and, uh, let alone moving with each other. Um, if you can, can you speak to this? And I just uh, wish nothing but peace to, to all. It, can you say a little more about what, what, what you mean? Um, it, uh, <laughs> just that, um, well, when I hear you, when I hear you speaking just now, I'm feeling like, wow, I wish that he would come to, um, to uh, school board meetings or uh, even PTAs so that parents can start to get even just a little taste of uh, thinking differently. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, many adults haven't been, been challenging themselves to think that schooling and learning could be done a different way so that every child would reach their own potential. Um, I think in terms of uh, wanting public education to uh, look at um, children uh, and have them know that they can ask themselves, what do I want to learn about? And then at, a, at an appropriate time and age, they would be guided, helped, guided by teachers and other community members to um, to self-direct themselves and their knowledge, but always guided. Um, and I'll say again that I've been steeping myself in this maybe for a decade um, and I read wonderful things. It just doesn't seem like people, I just want the word, I just want more people to know about it. And I want people like yourself and others that are writing and speaking to find each other and move together. Um, I'm a grandmother. And so like, uh, I guess it's a matter of time that is of ultimate concern for me. And um, I just get a little frustrated and anxious. And does that? <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I understand. I understand. It's, first of all, it's great to hear your voice. I, we've interacted like online before. Yes. I don't think we've ever spoken though. Um, yeah, and we have a mutual friend. and. In ba. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'll say that. Well, let me just, I, I think you're absolutely right, and your concern is, 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 is really valid. Um, I'll, I'll say this that um, one of the things that, that I think is, is, is a challenge and is part of the, the work that, that I'm trying to do along with, with Tree is, is think through kind of like, I, I think there are a lot of people that have an intuition educators, parents, et cetera, an intuition about some of the things that are not working. I think a lot of kids have an intuition about things that are not working. Um, there were things as a child, as, a, as a, a, I saw in school that were, were very, um, very uh, uh, troubling. And I, I, I didn't have the language to talk about it as a kid but I knew things that were wrong about the way that the schools were run when I was growing up and the way that, that, that things operated. You know, I saw certain injustices, for example, that I knew weren't right, but I didn't necessarily have the language or the, or the context for it. 
So I think, I guess, I guess um, other than to say I share your, 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 your concern and sense of urgency about it, because I do think it's, it's, it's urgent. I think that it's fundamentally important that we think through these questions about how we educate because so many of the challenges that we have uh, globally, so many of the things that we are seeking to do better in, we are, we are having trouble doing so because we're getting in our own way because of some of the assumptions we make about the world. And part of the, way, part of the reason we, we hold those assumptions is because of the way we're educated. Um, so I just say that like one way, one really important factor in having that conversation that you're talking about is figuring out some of the language that we can use to talk about it. Because sometimes it's very hard to get out of certain ways, for example, like mechanistic thinking about things, you know? And I think that, I think that a lot of really idealistic educators enter into school systems and then have trouble kind of like, you know, navigating how to do things differently because there's so many sort of the inertia of, of, of language and also of, of systems that are in place kind of gets in the way. So I would just say that like part of that process, it's, it's having the conversation, yes, but also, but also recognizing ways to talk about it. Yes. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. This was such a thought provoking, enriching conversation. I loved all the material you brought from your book. So appreciative that you were here to do this with all of us. We are over time now. So unfortunately, I feel so sorry to have to cut this conversation short. But thank you for that. Uh, we we can continue with the kinship hour for those of you in person, please step back for a cup of tea or a snack and, and join us in continued conversation. And for those of you online, thank you for being here and I will put up a breakout room if you're so interested to keep the conversation going. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Sure. I was a teacher at the uh -huh. and just with all, all ages, but I was simply the little boy in the alley with the gun. Yeah. Um, what did you mean when you said um, giving them the gun was teaching them about himself? Did you say that? It was. It was the the the, the fact of of his having a gun carried with it a whole set of meanings a story you know what i mean and 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 but at the time it's just gone